Welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. This is Keiko Price, Director of Athletics and Recreation at Emory University. I believe leaders should be transparent, bold, decisive, and empathetic. As a leader, if you are able to demonstrate these qualities, you won't have a problem rallying and inspiring others to join you on the journey towards success. I can say that the NCAA Pathway Program was extremely useful in helping me think through not only the qualities I want to have as a leader, but also the values I need to stay grounded as a leader. There isn't a day that goes by when I am not tested by situations in the chair that require me to apply my values to the decision-making process. Thank you, NCAA Pathway Program. Greetings, this is Ty Brown, and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast, where we highlight executive and organizational leadership. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at One Q Leadership. Our guest today is Chancellor Jim Schmidt. Chancellor Schmidt is the chancellor at University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and he also serves as the chairman of the Division Three President's Council for the NCAA. Greetings, Jim, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So Wisconsin-Eau Claire is a school that it has tremendously expanded facilities for athletics, right? Yes, that's true. And it's a school where you talk about the importance of athletics on campus, the purpose of athletics to enhance the academic mission, and you have a president who seems to understand why that's important. Because I'd right. imagine you wouldn't be serving as a chairman of the President's Council right. if you didn't understand the importance of athletics. And there, if the president is on board, I imagine the faculty on campus is on board. If, if, you, if you have the right conversation with them. If you have the right conversations. Talk to me a little bit about that aspect of you being in that role and the importance of athletics on campus. Yeah, so UW Eau Claire is about 11,000 students, about 10,000 undergraduates and 1,000 graduate students. Right. It's uh, very much what you might view as a very traditional, residential, in-person, high-touch environment. Mm -hmm. And so our faculty, and I inherited this culture, will do just about anything uh, necessary to help a student succeed. And so we're really down, we're down in the weeds and the trenches with every single student that chooses to come to UW Eau Claire to help them be successful, successful academically, socially, to help build them for that next step in society, both the job, civic life, family, inter interpersonal relationships around them. And so when a student crosses the stage at commencement and I shake their hand and give them their diploma, we've said as an institution, this person's prepared. And one of the things that we've talked about at UW Claire, and I think my predecessors have done that as well, is we can do that. We have to meet students where they are, do what helps motivate them, help them find their passion, both in the classroom and from the extracurricular activities as well. And athletics really serves up an amazing portfolio for our athletes to take advantage of. One of the things that we've talked about with our faculty, we have very uh, important dashboard goals that we make them public. We wanna increase our student retention rate from the freshman to sophomore year to 90%. And we've burrowed down to make individualized approaches as opposed to saying, look, we're gonna make all of our freshmen do X, Y, and Z, which is a waste of time. A lot of the students don't need that extra help. So we gotta meet them where they're at. And with athletics, I have helped share the data and the stories with our faculty that shows the importance of uh, how athletics actually supports the entire student, not just athletically, but academically, socially, physically, and from a mental health perspective, yeah. which more and more has become an issue. Um, for example, the, as, as college athletes on our campus, the freshman to sophomore retention rate, is about 90%, where the student body as a whole is 83 to 84%. Particularly for our students of color, um, they find even more value. Uh, black men who are athletes on our campus are typically retained in the 91, 92, 93 percentile year over year, which is a full couple points ahead of white student athletes. Right. And when I talk to the faculty about this, we talk about what are those major components. Well, first of all, there's a strong sense of belonging and all students need that sense of belonging. They don't have to get it from athletics, but we can look for where they can get that. Secondly, they have upper class mentors who are watching out for them, talking to them in a very real sense, people who've been where they've been, people they can relate to. They're trusted adults, coaches, other people around athletics that have a real stake in their success. 
we know as a Division III school that we're there primarily for the academic mission. And the fact is, athletics can help draw students in to do their academic work in ways that we can. We're seeing something across the nation where men are not going to college in the same number as women have, and that number has accelerated over the last 10 years. We've learned from men in particular that athletics can really be that support system that draws them in and keeps them focused in their academics. Yeah. The same is true for women. It's just the numbers are even more startling for men. I, I wonder about some of the data you mentioned when you, when you talk about black men who aren't athletes yeah. and the retention rate there at Oakland. So they tend to be in that 70% range. Okay. So that's a major difference where the student body as a whole is re being retained at about 83, 84%. So you have 10 or more point disconnect. Mm -hmm. One of our major goals as an institution is to close the opportunity gap by 2025. Well, I just looked at the clock. I've got about a year more to <laughs> yeah, get right. that done. You gotta get it right. And what we found is we've actually shooting the lights out on a number of those measures, involvement in our high impact experiences like study abroad, um, uh, undergraduate research, internships. In the areas of study abroad and undergraduate research, our students of color are actually participating at higher levels. And we have found that to be a transformational experience. The ability to go into another culture and another part of the world and immerse yourself into yeah. that helps critical thinking, world perspective, and helps understand your place kind of in this world that you can make a difference. So we've also seen that in a number of the other aspects that we measure. And you know, we're, we're clo we've closed the gap on, re we're getting closer on retention and graduation rates for them as well. And frankly, there aren't many schools in the country that have set that audacious of a goal yeah. and then taken the time analytically and socially to burrow down, not with the whole class of 2,200 freshmen, mm -hmm. but down to the groups of 10, five, and even one. And by doing that focus, you don't wear out the institution trying to provide the same service for all 2,200 students, but not all of them need it because they're getting it through athletics. Yeah. An example is marching band it has a similar retention profile. And that of course fits right in back with athletics. And I saw I interviewed an athletic director from Valparaiso recently, yeah. and he has a social work background. And some of the things we're talking about sound like that, right? People's identity in subgroups and how they fit into the, the big group and those types of things. One thing I think I know, but I haven't done any research or I haven't done the data, yeah. is that black, black folks, African-American, when we feel like we're a part of a community, that's when we stay from our freshman to our sophomore year and our they sophomore excel. junior. It's not, and exactly. it's, and it's, cause it's even more important, mm -hmm. frankly, particularly if you had a predominantly white institution right. to have that sense of community belonging. Exactly. People, that people care about you really and know you. You know, the bond between athletes and athletes and coaches is really yeah. something special. You know, when you get people who are 80 years old and they're still calling um, their coach, yeah. coach, <laughs> right? Yeah, right yeah. You know, and, and we've had those kind of gatherings on campus and it's, it's, it's magical and that's that lifelong bond. You know, similar to outcomes with fraternities, sororities, other things as well. Yeah. So what's interesting though is you've identified, right, this thing called community and all the aspects of community that, that uh, a black male student athlete will find in athletics and on their teams. And you do the, you do the, the research and, and get the data down to a point to say, what are those things? What is this thing we're calling community? And you said there were four or five points. Yeah. And then you say, well, can we create that on campus yeah. where the numbers are significantly lower than everybody else on campus for the black male right. student? I think that's genius actually, yeah. because it's acknowledging that there is this thing here that is keeping people here. Yeah. Can we take that thing and create it on campus? It's actually getting some attention. We're finding that in higher ed, that that isn't the typical approach. It's definitely not the typical approach. Well, <laughs> I can but you know, you that. part of it is, you know, we don't have the resources that we need, yeah. you know, and we actually had programs I was told even before I got there where they slotted in, you know, all black people into study skills classes. Well, you have people with 34 ACTs, straight A's, and they're yeah, right. like, excuse me, what? Exactly. And so you can't, you can't use those blunt instruments mm -hmm. to say, this is the issue. So we go through and we take a look at the profile of the student, mm -hmm. what has been their success in the past, in the admissions piece. But then we have to realize you're bringing, particularly students of color onto a predominantly white campus, and you just, you need to check in with them. You need to talk to them. You need to actually assess and find out directly from them what motivates them. And most importantly, you gotta listen and hear what those issues are. Yeah, I think and, then that's we, and, and then having that peer mentorship, and you, and you see that in the marching band. Mm -hmm. We have the world's largest marching band, 450 people. Wow. Yep. 
and one director. And so a lot of that's through section leaders. And again, you build that kind of tight relationship. Part of it is you bring in fall athletes, just like the marching band, two weeks before the rest of the student body gets there. So for a first year student, they have an intense sense of community. They know their way around campus. They feel like someone's got their back. So all that first week jitters that a freshman has, at some point sitting by themselves in their dormitory, yeah. You know, that's that sense of loneliness. And we're, we're, we're coming up with medical terms to describe loneliness yeah. on campus. In particular, if you're a person of color on a predominantly white campus, you can feel very isolated. So this is interesting because then you recreate that, right? Right. For incoming freshmen that aren't student athletes, aren't in the band, aren't already in a community. Yeah. And you say, if this is the thing that works, then let's make it work right across the board. And so we, we, we categorize that group of students as under-engaged students. Yeah. And then we have things that we do. So part of it is we have all these first week activities and we have students scanning their IDs as they're coming in. And we go through and we look at the student database and we say, wow, John here hasn't been to anything. Wow, yeah. Let's make sure, let's have the RA check in with them week two or as soon as we know about that. Let's have somebody else, a faculty member, ask them to stay in class or go up and talk to them as before they leave class to have that that soft touch, that level of engagement. One of the things I ask parents, I say to parents, don't be helicopter parents. Stop, yeah. stop badgering your students. They feel enough pressure already. And I say this to the students that I remind them at family weekend, the one thing I'll allow you to badger your freshmen on is, have they gone in to meet with a faculty member during office hours yet? Because that's a key indicator, That because that's that ability to sit down. But it takes some courage, right? come out of a high school, this isn't how this works in a high school. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, the office hours isn't for them to work in their office, their office hours. This is a language issue, which is we also have for first generation students. It's this notion that, no, this is when we get to just chat. Yeah. And, and one of my, you know, axioms of leadership is you've got to build the relationship before you need it. What's well, actually the same is true for students. Um, if, and I've told my own, you know, here, dad, I've got three sons, right? and I give them advice in college, and what does dad know about this? Yeah. And I've had to bad enough, have you met with a faculty member yeah, in our office of hours? And again, that's where you start to build that understanding. So as the semester goes on, and maybe you do get a little sideways and not understanding an academic assignment, you feel more confident to go ask the faculty member about it. The faculty member is more likely to approach you and have it be very comfortable saying, hey, you're screwing up. No, hey, I noticed you struggled with this aspect on the quiz or the paper or the test. Mm -hmm stop by the office, we'll talk about it. And then that isn't viewed as a threat or a punishment, but rather someone's helping to lift them. And students really are attracted to that. They can tell with an adult if they're there to judge them or are they there to help yeah, lift them. Yeah, 100%. Them. So this research and the outcomes that you've discovered from the research, um, is, is that something you're sharing with the academic body we've been we've been sharing that within the university of wisconsin system okay. and many of our folks who work very hard on this have been asked into both regional and national conferences okay. to do presentations yeah on that. i mean it's excellent i mean in my mind i've, I've always said this I, i've grown to i work i lived in waco texas for almost 20 years and worked part-time at baylor university and there was a woman there named uh doc uh Ms., mrs pearl beverly director of multicultural affairs yep. been there for 30 some years and you know you talk about creating a community so that people of color coming through feel valued yep. and they want to come from, you know, from freshman year, sophomore year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, graduate. And, and, you know, you look at some universities and you don't know if they, they value that. And if they understand that, Hey, this community is the reason why at some point your retention rates were higher than a lot of people in the state of Texas. Right. And then, you know, you can't prove it cause it's just, the thought in theory, but then if you get some academic institution who's saying, no, 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 look at these things. This is what we're trying to tell you. This is important. I think that'll help across the country. And we've seen it with our doing. LGBTQ students as well. Yeah, and we, ha you know, we've, we've, uh, we've ranked as high as third in the country behind, I think it was MIT and maybe Stanford. Mm -hmm. We were ranked number three in the country. We typically be highly rated there. And it's about setting up those same support mechanisms. We've created what we call rainbow floors in a number of the residence halls. So they build that sense of community. They feel safe. Yeah. Because people can't study, they can't process if they don't feel safe. And that's and, and safety is that word used a lot. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by sense of belonging, that sense that you're not going to be attacked for who you are. Psychologically right? safety, it is. physical safety, all it those is. things, which is very important. Chair of the Division Three Presidents Council. Yeah. So 
You know, I don't know how it was 30 years ago for a president on a university and how involved they were with athletics. Yep. But at, at now, you're heavily involved with it. I mean, it's yep. important. And, and so tell me about that in terms of your thoughts on athletics on campus beyond what we've talked about. Yeah. You mentioned offline, you know, a few years ago, the school had to, had to cut positions. Yep. And then a couple of years after you're saying, hey, we're going to spend this money on some new sports. Yep. Tell me about that juxtaposition in yeah. terms of- So the state of Wisconsin practice. went through massive cuts in 2015. Mm -hmm. It affected about 15% of our workforce, 189 positions, 240 some people. And it was a terrible time for the university. Yeah. And, you know, how you cut also says a lot about where you put your priority. Yeah, and, that's interesting. And I said, so the closer the dollar that we spend is to the student experience, we're going to do everything we can to protect that dollar. And the further away it is, even if it's, we think it's important, we're going to start there. And so I cut senior administration by 32 percent. We cut all non-academic divisions by at least 20 percent by the time we made it to the classroom. And that still ended up being painful at about 11 percent. Wow. But it was all focused on understanding you can't do cross board cuts. You have to figure out how, how, how does the university going to look after this and how can it be successful afterwards? You can bemoan the cuts and I could talk forever why I think that those are a really bad idea. Yeah. But we don't get to just spin in our chairs and complain. As leaders of these institutions, we have to go back to meeting our mission. And mm -hmm. so if you're mission driven, you stay mission focused, that helps you make smart decisions. While we were cutting in those areas, we actually overcut to create a whole new division of, of advising to make sure, again, uh, a trusted adult could meet students where they're at, because wow. we knew that that was going to be the recipe for the future. So we, sure enough, we saw our enrollments continue to climb because we were making the right kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. And I had open forums with the faculty and staff about how do we invest these dollars, again, to help us meet our mission. There were new academic majors that were added at, after not long after having to cut some really difficult things. Mm -hmm. But we talked about, again, the importance of us meeting our enrollment goals and our retention and graduation goals, particularly for students of color. And so we brought we brought back baseball. It had, it had exited the campus about 25 years earlier. We brought in men's soccer. And one of the things I pushed on that is if you take a look at soccer teams across the country, you'll see a great deal of diversity. And we had a growing Hispanic population in our area that was really pretty significant. And our goal was to see that we could attract the sports where people were at. And then we added women's lacrosse as well. And all three of the teams have done well. They've uh, full rosters and it tends to bring in students from even further away to have that opportunity to participate yeah, in that. And that's excellent. One of the things we had to overcome, though, is most of our facilities were owned by the city, YMCA's, and wow. other areas. So we'd been sharing facilities. We had an old 1951 uh, arena that was built when we had 600 students. <laughs> right. And if you wanted to redo Hoosiers at any time, you could go <laughs> in to <laughs> Zorn Arena yeah. and you, would, you wouldn't have to change a thing. I mean, it yeah. absolutely looked like Hoosiers. And it had been part of our master plan. And so with the generosity of a group of alum, husband and wife, a $70 million gift, one of the largest wow. ever given to an institution mm -hmm. uh, to build a new arena, indoor field house, uh, partnership with Mayo Clinic for sports medicine in the facility, as well as a fitness facility. And it's a beautiful location. And we're, we're still doing a lot of sharing of facilities and we will share this one with the community. That helps also make the connection. Yeah. So it's important, you can't treat students as though they're in a bubble just on campus. One of the things I've prioritized is building those town gown relationships. And I would argue we have some of the best in the country. Yeah. And so that our students feel welcomed when they're in celebrated, when they go off campus, particularly again, if you have students of color in a predominantly white community, it's important that they feel welcomed in the restaurants, stores, on the streets, and you build that camaraderie. And that's also one of the things that's important about athletics. We have amazing arts and music programs, so we bring people in from the community there. But people come in to support our blue gold teams. In fact, the year that our football team went zero and ten, wow. we had the third highest average attendance <laughs> at football games across all of Division Three. Wow. That shows you a community that wants to be there to support mm -hmm. the athletes. Yeah, which which is which is excellent. And they like seeing the marching band, which is the biggest in the country. Right? Yeah, that uh, seventy million dollar gift. It was all for athletics? It was for this facility, for the arena, the field house, the fitness center. Wow. All of it. And then we had another uh, foundation came in with an extra $10 million and made it all carbon negative. Wow. Okay. Whole solar array set up um, and geothermal power for it. 
and then the city came in with some additional dollars to actually expand the size of the arena mm -hmm. a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's super but interesting. But it was one couple made a huge difference. Man, you, you can't beat something like that, right? No. When you talk about national, national uh, college athletics and you talk about the purpose of an athletics department is to enhance the academic mission of the yes. university, there are some faculty who don't buy in to what college athletics brings. Yep. But you talk about being the chair of this, of this council of presidents. I, I wonder about the, you know, just the, the thoughts of presidents in terms of, of the importance, because I can hear in, in how you talk about it, the importance of athletics for yeah. campus. But I wonder about that across the country when you talk about enhancing the academic mission of a university and yeah. that's the purpose of athletics and, and do across the board do you see that your fellow presidents believe in that and have a passion for it or is it something that they just have to deal with because it's such a big expense on campus type situation well, well so yeah the ncaa has got three divisions right and it looks a little bit different at each of the three divisions right. and yet there are things that they ha they hold in common as well i can obviously i worked at a division two school before coming here i was vice president for almost 15 years so i had that experience attended d1 school for graduate programs but at the D3 level, I can say uniformly that the presidents that I've had the privilege of interacting with over the four years I've been on the President's Council have really been remarkable. And it really gets back to that understanding that partnership, the notion that uh, students are getting so much more out of this other than just playing their sport. Yeah. They're developing those leadership skills. You know, the, the placement rates for athletes are always among the highest. Mm -hmm. You know, employers are really going after a look for these people because they've again got the team skills, they've got independent uh, problem solving skills, and they they've they know what it's like to work around being goal centered. Um, but what I've noticed is that each of these presidents have been deeply committed to understanding that connection and not separating the academics uh, from the athletics. And we realize that you know we have a unique opportunity because we can play more locally than say some of the big Division One institutions where players frankly have to be on planes a lot and yeah. sometimes their game schedule is set more by TV and others so that becomes more complicated and because of that those those presidents have to make sure they have the support systems to make sure their students can also get both mm -hmm. even though what they're doing feels very differently. Right. What I've noticed is that. We have a program every year where our athletes invite key faculty and staff who are important to them to be there, to have them stand up, to be honored. And that kind of uh, mentorship and that relationship has gone a long way. And so even though many of our faculty have a D1 experience and they might have a D1 perspective when they come to Eau Claire, um, they find out that the coaches are paid not very much money, yeah. you know, less than a typical professor might and that the students are really amazing people and are, are able to manage the load better. In fact, athletes have a higher GPA mm -hmm. than the student body as a whole. Again, their retention rates and graduation rates are better than the student body as a whole. Right. How do you argue with that? And frankly, they tend to show that a uh, little bit of competitiveness and leadership ability in the classroom as well. And faculty, you know, that's what lights faculty up is that notion that they get energized yeah. by what they're discussing. Yeah, which is excellent. Well, this has been an excellent conversation, very yeah. enlight enlightening for me. I'm, I, I can almost assume, I think, safely that uh, if you start with the student athletes and expand to the student body and the faculty, they are probably happy to have you as president in the leadership role, which sounds like the student experience is at the forefront of all your all your thoughts there it, at Eau Claire. It, it is. I'm now in my 11th year yeah. at UW-Eau Claire, and so they know what I'm about. Right. But one of the things I figured out in the first month on the job, that no matter how crazy of an idea I had, if I could explain to the faculty and staff in an authentic, compelling way why whatever it was I was asking them to do was good for students, mm -hmm. They would go along with they it, go, even go if they weren't board. excited about it. They would go along. They'd say, "You're right, and we we do need to do this. We yeah. need to maybe work a little harder, do things a little bit differently, because it's good for students." Yeah. I have to tell you, I'm incredibly blessed to have inherited a campus culture like that, and you know, I'm I'm proud of our blue golds. Yeah, which is excellent. Well, I really appreciate you joining me on the One Question Leadership Podcast. It's my pleasure. Yes, sir. That was Chancellor Jim Smith. He is the chancellor at University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And he also serves as the president of the Division Three President's Council with the NCAA. And of course, I am Ty Brown with one question. And keep in mind, 
The role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today. This episode of the One Question Leadership Podcast is produced by Spades Media Group, solving problems using creative leadership.